I mixed my paint and now I gotta think about a little bit about where I'm going with this before I can just start speaking freely about the subject that I want to discuss. But I, th I think it's funny. I think it's funny that I never really know what I'm doing. I never really know what I'm doing with paint. I think I think I read Gustav Klimt said the same thing. It's hard to believe it in his case. I mean, I don't think you could ever. I don't. I don't know what he meant. I don't know if he meant the same thing I mean, because that man knew what he was doing with paint. I mean, if any human being on this planet ever knew what they were doing with paint, Gustav Klimt knew what the fuck he was doing with paint. So. I don't know, yeah, I don't know what he meant by that, but maybe he didn't say it. Maybe I'm mistaking it. So, it was a, something, I think it was something he said in a letter he wrote when he was traveling in Spain or something. And he wrote a letter to someone saying that he thought, as always, he he's thinking he's having these great realizations, but... Who knows, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, I am not Klimt. That's for damn sure. And it's a damn shame because that man was a real master. And he isn't given his due. It's amazing. It's amazing how people love Klimt. His popularity amongst ordinary people, you know, everyday people, is huge. And yet the art world, I mean, you know, the, the, the art market is starting to catch up to uh, an appreciation of him just because he started selling at a high rate that reflects his popularity with actual human beings rather than the critics. But the critics, you know, I don't know. I haven't read an art history book in a while, but he sure as hell didn't have much of a place in the history of modern art last time I looked. So I don't know if they've updated that or what, but uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing how they just write people out of art history. You know, I mean, what I've realized, one thing that... Facebook is one thing I can say for Facebook as much as I hate it for so many reasons. But one one cool thing about their groups is I'm starting to see images from art history because I'm, I'm part of all these groups that are, uh, you know, art, art historical sort of things. And I'm starting to see images that have been left out of art history and, you know, for a long time we've had, you know, it's been popular to, 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 you know, try to bring back women and people of color who have been left out of our history. And that's a worthwhile thing to do. But there's a ton of men who've also been left out of it for no good reason, you know, other than they just weren't the popular ones or the trendy ones or whatever. It's just a ton of people. Just a ton of people who got left out. A ton of artworks that, you know definitely deserve some honorable mention that, that just you just can't they're just not there and, and you wonder why the world solidified well what I should say is the historical narrative why the historical narrative solidified around one artwork and not another I mean it's all having to do with critics that's why I'm starting to write a lot about you know about myself and and talk about myself. I want to promote myself. Michelangelo was smart. He did that. He built his own legend and it stuck. You know, the, the genius Michelangelo thing stuck until this day. It's like you know, the man knew what he was doing. You know, you got to swing that marketing and people who don't, but people who aren't good at it, they might have an amazing product, but they're left out of art history you know, because no one was there to speak up for me. And people are such pussies when it comes to speaking up for an artist that, that they like.
People are such pussies when it comes to standing by their aesthetic tastes. I mean, it's, and I think maybe they weren't always like that. Probably back in the day, you know, back in the, back in the classical sort of European high point, they were probably, you know, almost too much the opposite direction. They probably were too too much, uh, you know, ready to proclaim their tastes and, and proclaim whether something was good or bad. I think it's, that's definitely something that was, that has been a feature. It's been a feature of, um, blah, 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 what am I trying to say? Modern art. It's been a feature of modern art. Um, because, well, um, you know, when that, I mean, that's basically what modern art did. It was opening the way for, for, for new things. But in order to open the way for new things, it had to cast huge amounts of shade derision onto uh, conventional tastes. By casting all that shade and derision onto conventional tastes, what it basically did was it made people really scared to just voice sort of obvious like what they like because they didn't know if they, they didn't know if they're going to be you know ridiculed for their for what they're expressing enthusiasm for because it wasn't the the cool thing the in thing the you know challenging progressive whatever whatever avant-garde thing that you know that they thought it, it needed to be or that, that the world was responding to in that era and that's really, that's really what was going on, you know. It was a real case of the emperor's new clothes for a long time. And I'm a little ambivalent about that, you know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not necessarily on board with the idea that, that, you know, nothing was gained from that and we, we should just roll back the, you know, roll it back to when, you know, we only, the only, you know, acceptable sort of artwork it was this very classical stuff and I'm, I'm not on board with that but but let's be real let's be honest let's be honest about what happened you know there's no need there's no reason we can't be honest about what happened and what happened was precisely that people were afraid to stand up for what they liked because they would be i mean <laughs> For the most childish things, you know, and these are grown adults, the people in the highest positions of society were afraid just to say, hey, this is bullshit. You know, they were afraid to call it out. They were afraid. They didn't want to look. It's just playground. It's playground dynamics. They didn't want to look like not the cool kids or what have you. Grown ass people acting this way. It's interesting, right? pretty interesting that that's how that that's how it was well that's how it still is i'm sure that's like i said people are major pussies when it comes to standing up for their aesthetic preferences their tastes in art they're still traumatized from from the century of derision the century of condescending views from the avant-garde taste Taste keepers, gatekeepers of taste. They're still, they're still freaked out about that. You know, Un I, don't, I won't say freaked out. They're, they're still uncertain. They're still sort of like, I don't know. I haven't, they're not as, not as, it's not as bad as it used to be. People are slowly but surely reclaiming their right to party. You gotta fight for your right to party, to like the kind of art that you like without any apology. Yeah? Oh, God. So let's, let's get into it. Let's talk about what I'm doing here. It's pretty funny. I'm painting Las Vegas in the style of uh, Turner. <laughs> J, what is his name? J-M-W Turner? J-W something? Turner. You know, Turner. Come on, people. You guys got to know Turner. Come on. Pinky up. Get your aesthetic uh, prejudice. Get your aesthetic uh, 
Now I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to shame you if you don't know your classical uh, high point European civilization stuff. Turner was a great artist of the Romantic era. This last gasp of pure aesthetic sort of just, God, what do I call it? I wanted to say freedom, but was it just freedom or was it something more? It's just this beautiful moment in time in European civilization before, like right at the end, it was like right at the end, before total chaos took over with abstract and non-representational and conceptual and, and all modern art, you know, before modern art sort of corrupted, if we want to use that terminology, which I don't necessarily want to use, but before it just became really difficult to make the kind of art that is deeply enjoyable and satisfying. You know, before, just before that, there's this little window of time, the romantic era where, oh my God, such beautiful things were created. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you can't see what I'm doing now, but I mean, basically, I'm getting lost in, in this cloudy atmosphere. I love Turner. I just love Turner. I didn't understand. It took me a long time to, to come to the appreciation for Turner. Um, it took me a long time. But, you know, I mean, anyway, you know, I find myself getting a little too crazy with the atmosphere in this painting and uh, I've had to tone it down several times because uh, I keep wanting to make a, a turner and it's not this shouldn't be a turner this is Las Vegas it's the postmodern wasteland it's in the middle of the Nevada desert it's not a really atmospheric place full of uh, you know moisture and 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 uh, you know these interesting natural lights that Turner was interested in. It's, it's, it's a very different place. It's a place uh, with a great big desolate sky, a big empty, not very cloudy sky, I think. So yeah, so I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be getting all crazy with these clouds. I just can't help it. This is what I want to do. This is what I, what I want to do. And that's, as an artist, you can always bring in a little bit of what you want, of what you really want to be doing into a commission. And this is a commissioned artwork. You always got to bring in a little bit. You don't have to, I guess. I, guess. I think that's what separates a real artist from a whatever, you know, decorative painter or whatever. It's, it's, you just can't. Can you just not help to put a little bit of yourself into it? Can you really approach it so cold, so cold that you just don't put any of yourself into it? I don't know. I almost, I almost, almost want to say I kind of respect people who can do that. I almost do because, damn, what control, what discipline, you know, they have to paint that way. I've tried. Lord knows I've tried just can't can't I don't have that kind of discipline sometimes I've tried some there is something to be said for planning out your composition as if you were Napoleon commanding his troops and you know you make decisive choices and you stick to your battle plans and you see it through unless there's a better reason why you need to turn on your heels and go in a different direction with it but you're still calculating it and weighing every decision and you're boldly charging on with your painting. I don't know. Um, I try that sometimes, but I always get taken over by spontaneous impulses, spontaneous impulses to be a little experimental to try this or try that. Oh, what would it be? What would happen if I wonder what would happen if I just added a little more intense blue right in here. And I know it doesn't go along at all with my plan, but maybe it would be cool. Maybe I should do that. 
and then I, and then before you know it, I fucked it all up because I just couldn't stick with the plan. Couldn't stick. I had to wonder what could be, what glorious thing might be if I just try this little different idea. It's a bad idea, Brian. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Be cold. Be cold. I think Vincent Desiderio apparently said that. My friend Leo said he heard him say that when he came and visited Cal State Long Beach. He said, like, when I paint, I'm cold. I think I even heard him repeat that on a podcast with some Irish dude. See, I fucked it up in the middle there. To, I, I put that bright blue. Looks awful. I think it's acceptable here. It doesn't really, you don't really see it too much in the, I guess there's little areas of it, but it's the brightest. I guess, you know, it can be the brightest. It can be, it can exist in one spot, but this here, that's just, that's just a, a blight, a blight on the, on the thing. So I'm gonna bring some of this yellow light back into here, mix it with this periwinkle looking kind of blue and we'll see. We'll see. Oh, we're working with a shitty brush. I love painting with shitty brushes. Shitty brushes, if you're into that Whistler, wait, Whistler? Turner, if you're, I guess Whistler too. But if you're into that Turner style, you know, if, you're, if that's what you're going for, a shitty brush is the best brush. I've always, I've always said to my students, Good artist, a great artist can do, a great artist can do great things with shitty materials. Should be able to, at any rate. That's what I think. I don't know. I'm starting to change my mind a little teeny bit on that. Um... Once in a while, okay, let's say that a great artist should be able to do very good things with shitty materials, very good things, but to do truly great things, maybe a great artist also needs great materials. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I believe that or not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It depends on the thing. It depends on the thing. There are moments when that is probably the case, but there are moments when it's not. Anyway, you didn't come here for my wisdom on painting. You came here for... Actually, I don't know why you came here. Maybe you just like hoping to catch a glimpse of my bald spot through my hair. Uh, uh, maybe, like me, you're just lonely, and the sound of someone's voice on the YouTube video makes you feel less lonely, even though you have your own family that you could go to for the loneliness thing. It just feels less lonely when there's a total stranger talking to you from the other side of the void of obscurity that is the internet. I've thought about that, I've wondered, is that part of the reason why I listen to YouTube videos sometimes? Like, I'm not even necessarily, I mean, I always like information, getting more information, but you know, is there, sometimes is that really the reason? Do I really need more information in this moment? I ask myself, you know? Or is this, is this just some sense of like, I, I think it's a re, it's a re, it's an attempt to replace the community that we've lost just by virtue of our modern lifestyle. Like modern life, our, the way we live nowadays has robbed us of a certain sort of community that we used to have as tribal sort of animals. 
you know, early humans, even after we left the animal stage, just that early human sort of existence. And, uh, yeah, the internet, social media gives you a fake sense of that thing that was lost. Well, there we go. Now we're getting into the simulacra idea, which was actually sort of related to what I wanted to talk about. So good, good. Now, you may have noticed that I'm painting Las Vegas and if you followed along my video about postmodern architecture, you know that Las Vegas was pretty instrumental in the development of postmodern art. Maybe not postmodern philosophy, maybe not postmodern literature, but it was in postmodern art. And uh, it's, it's really interesting why, you know, to how disjointed, you know, postmodernism is. You got to go really deep to understand the connection between postmodern art and um, like postmodernism as we understand it, you know, philosophically uh, and whatnot. But, but it is, but I, I tried to trace that in, in one of my videos. I, I tried to trace that and show that the sort of, there's a hidden cynicism, a hidden cynical irony in postmodern art and architecture, you know, architecture sort of where it popped up first. There's a hidden cynical irony that that characterizes postmodern postmodern art and and that links it back to this sort of innate sort of nihilistic, you know, there is no such thing as, you know, objective truth or meaning or object or, or objective meaning, I should say. Uh, you know, with the postmodern philosophers and, uh, and and academics. So, um, yeah. So I railed against it. I railed against it. But, um, I don't know. Today I'm going to actually talk about something different. Because, you know, you, you might think, wow, are you being a hypocrite painting Las Vegas? First off, no, because this is a commission and I'm under no illusions of artistic integrity that precludes one from just doing a commission because, you know, I'm not rich and I need money. So, um, yeah, I don't feel bad about that at all. But, um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, the whole simulacra thing, the copy of the copy of the copy, that's Las Vegas. That's what I'm looking at right now. The copy of the copy of the copy, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful postmodern paradise for people who like that kind of thing. But that's not what I want to talk about today. That's not what I want to talk about. It's ironic. It's definitely ironic that I... Oh, good. My bald spot's showing for you. It's ironic that I'm um, painting it since I railed against it. And I will continue to rail against it. It is ironic. And yet, and yet it, it's not. And I'm get, today I'm going to tell you why it's not. Uh, <laughs> this is my... Apologia. I don't know how you say that in my apology, I guess. Um, my reasoned defense for my, for my actions. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about something that I've been thinking of as survival in the postmodern wasteland. Surviving in the postmodern wasteland. Yeah, if I was gonna like give a title to this, you know, write an academic, not an academic, but like say write a literary treatise, I would call it something like that. Survival in the postmodern wasteland. 
and it's even more than survive surviving it's it's an attempt i was it's, it's an attempt to not only survive but thrive thriving in the postmodern wasteland what i want to look at, look at today is the you know give, given that we find ourselves here in this postmodern I, I I hate to call it postmodern reality. I don't think that that reality is postmodern. I think uh, postmodernism describes uh, the situation that we're in, but it doesn't describe reality. Um, this postmodern setting, right? And and by the way, I don't actually don't think we're in postmodernism now, although you know. I, I need to I need to do a little bit of chewing on it exactly how I would because local distance made a great point when he said that we are living in postmodernism that Donald Trump is its first like inaugural president the president of postmodernism and I don't disagree with what he's saying and it is true that this so-called post truth post facts world definitely it is exactly what the postmodern uh, philosophers were were describing, you know, like 50 years ago or whatever. It is. It's taken the world a while to catch up to where they were, where where they were. They were ahead of their times. Uh, I, you know, uh, but. Well, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to try to make the argument right now. Even though there the the postmodern situation is something that, you know, does seem to describe where we're at right now. I would argue that culturally, culturally, we are definitely on the threshold of uh, some new directions. Um I I think we're at a fork in the road. There's a fork in the road going into two different post postmodernisms. Uh, there will be there's one that will be that's defined by the woke and where the woke want to go, and there's one that's defined by the the anti woke pushback. And so far, the pushback has been mainly negative in the sense of you know saying no no to something posited. So the positive in this sense is the negative and the negative is the positive because wokeness is definitely a bad thing if we're going to use negative in the term in the sense of like good and bad. But but um where was I going with this? I don't know. Does it matter? Yeah, there's two we're on the threshold of two different competing postmodernisms. Uh post Postmodernisms, right? Two two new paradigms are are struggling to be born. Uh, the the paradigm of the woke, the world that they want to see, uh, and the paradigm of the of the of the the, the anti woke. Uh, I suppose you could split it even more if you want. If people like splitting. Are you a lumper or, or a splitter? If you want to split more, you know, then there's. I'm sure there's. I don't really care to split hairs about the different kinds of woke wokenesses that exist. I'm sure there are, but yeah, I mean, within the anti woke, there's definitely you know there's Christians who just want to go back to Christendom, and there's atheists who probably envision something else. There's people who the you know the kind of collaboration between the Christians and atheists that sort of maybe just want to a, a recommitment to Western liberal ideals that allow both of them to exist. Um, so that, that's the area where, where I fit in, where I, you know, where I would like to lend my own, my own voice. Um, but, but it's more than, it's more than just that. Cause that, is just returning to where what we had is not a thrilling or exciting proposition, right? Even if what we had was good, and it was, it was. 
I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm not saying it wasn't. Even if what we had was good, but no one's no one's inspired to go back to. Let's go back to how things were 15 years ago, 20 years ago. You know, 100 years ago. Like I don't think anyone would say we want to go back to where we were 100 years ago. But you know, I guess. Yeah, in the articulation of the of the defense of classical, you know, liberal democracy and uh, Western civilization, <laughs> in the in the defense of that, will em will be will emerge. Uh, this sort of a defin a, a definition that is positive, a definition that is positive. That is, if you want to use the word progressive, that is progress that progresses that takes us forward. I think that you know I'm going to be the one to make it because I'm an incredibly important person uh, sitting in my tiny little studio in the middle of nowhere. I'm not in the middle of nowhere, but it feels that way. I might as well be in the middle of nowhere. What I'm trying to say is I'm aware of my sense of, my inflated sense of self-importance. But yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want to take a hack at, at writing the, the manual for, the, the manifesto for the new paradigm? Of course I want to. I got some ideas. I got some ideas. I'll let, I'll let you guys have them soon. When I get there, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm, I'm, I got other things to do. You know, defining the defining the new paradigm for for um, the progress of Western civilization. That's that stuff you do on your spare time after your family's taken care of, and you know, when you got a little bit of extra energy and you you know finish these side projects that you're working on and your main side project, which is my book thoughts, which will be available within two months because I just decided that it will. I could have, I could have finished it. I could have finished it like two years ago if I had wanted to, but I've just been dragging my heels on that for some reason. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Being too careful. I'm being too careful with this. I should be a little more haphazard. What am I trying to say here? What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So today is not the day when I when I reveal you know my 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 vision for the prog the progress of, of the, the new avant-garde, um, which, you know, I'll give you a little spoilers. It's kind of, I think it's gonna be like the Renaissance where you're moving forward by looking back, you know? Some people I'm sure have already articulated this. I'm just gonna articulate it a lot better than they did. <laughs> God, I'm such a cocky bastard. Sometimes I wonder, you know, sometimes I wonder this, this, this immense confidence that I feel, am I only feeling it because I'm allowed to feel it within like my little cocooned world where I can pretend that I'm this awesome figure, this towering intellect, this artistic genius. And if I'm actually out in the world, you know, faced with confrontational situations, will I just crumble and fold like quickly, <laughs> the moment that <laughs> some oppositional forces thrust at me, maybe uh, be interesting. Uh, anyway, anyway, let's talk about surviving in the postmodern postmodern wasteland. I find that really interesting. Before we get into that, let me think about this goddamn Ferris wheel, which isn't very symmetrical right now, the base. See, that's that's what I was worried about. I was getting too into what I was saying and I 
kind of let it go a little bit. Kind of let it go a little bit. I might need to just switch gears and think a little more carefully about it. Something interesting, something interesting, and why I like painting with shitty brushes sometimes is, you know, like, let's say with symmetry, if you don't nail it, it there's this, there's this place where it, like, if you come close, but you don't come close enough, is it would have been better if you just hadn't even tried, you know, like, that's an interesting thing. I think they call that the uncanny valley when it, when it refers to, um, naturalism or, or a realistic appearance of, of things. The uncanny valley. I, I, I call it the creepy valley. I like creepy valley better than uncanny because it's creepy. The uncanny valley is a creepy thing. All right, before we get to the postmodern wasteland, just got to talk about painterbation. Painterbation is a term that I heard in, uh, in, in college. Not mine. I didn't come up with it. It's a great term, though. I wish I had come up with it. That's when a painter is just sort of lost in the act of painting, pushing values and colors back and forth, pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling, lost in that activity. And they think they're doing great things, but in reality, it's kind of just whatever. Not, they think great things are happening, but it's not really true. It's not great things aren't necessarily happening. Just painterbation. They're lost in their own little painterbation that nobody else cares about but them. And, you know, good for them. You want to be all, you know, narcissistic about it. Fine, fine. But I'm, I'm interested in doing real things. I'm interested in, I'm interested in stuff that matters, stuff that counts, actions that count, my friends. I've wasted enough hours painting things that don't matter, layers that get hidden. And then there's this bullshit belief, superstition, really, that some painters have that they've imbued their canvases with some sort of mystical power just because there's paintings upon paintings upon paintings buried in there that the viewer will never see. Somehow these imbue it. I don't... Don't go in for that shit. Do not go in for that shit. It's the fucking surface. You see, what you see is like, you know, a fraction of a millimeter deep. That's it. You know, if you're painting with transparent layers, okay. Okay. If you're really good at that and you're painting with transparent layers, maybe you see some of that. I mean, I certainly am going for a storied look. As, uh, as I've heard it described, you know, the history and the mark making is evident in layers upon layers. But I'm not, in order to create this, you don't need as many layers as you think. And I'm not going to celebrate and glorify the layers that are buried so deeply under here that you don't even see them. I'll, my glorification of that process stops at the very last layer that your eyes can detect, not a not a not a micro millimeter beyond that. Doesn't matter. Whatever whatever that is, that is lost. That doesn't matter. That is time wasted, my friends. Time wasted. Your time is precious. Don't waste your time. Okay, that's my rant on painterbation. Um, I don't know what I think about this. I guess I saved it. I think I saved it. I was trying not to be too obvious about like the Ferris wheel being like the sun and referencing like a sun by having like too much light there, but push it off to the side a little bit. We'll see. I think I also disguised the infrastructure of the thing that holds it up so that the slight asymmetry there won't mess with my head so much. So now the question is, how much do I want to define the, the bring back the definition that's been lost? Mm, I'm not sure. I might need to step back for that. Yeah, you probably can see it from there. Oh, you can't see it, right? I guess that's, then I need to call it back.
call it back from the obscurity. Bring it back a little bit more. It's a little too, it got too faint. It needs to register, it needs to register a little bit, but I think I'll leave it a little, I'll definitely leave it more faint than it was before. I'm not gonna call it back too much. Surviving in the postmodern wasteland. All right, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. First off, where am I gonna start? First off, I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna make an admission. I'm gonna make an admission. Fucking don't like to admit it, but I'm gonna admit it. You know, sometimes what is the, the, the juicy part, the sexy part, the part that you don't think is sexy, the part that doesn't seem sexy, you know, is the, the, so the truth is the truth is sexier a lot of times than the you know what so, you know what sometimes it's just not sexy sometimes the truth isn't sexy okay let's not let's not lie to ourselves the truth isn't always sexy it would be sexy if i was painting this for like you know if i was painting this for let's say minimum ten thousand dollars to some like posh art collector uh, that would be sexy but I'm not. I'm painting it for $2,000 for my grandma. <laughs> my grandma and her boyfriend. But I love them. I love them. And so, I mean, that's why I'm really trying hard for this one. I love them. I want them to have a good thing. And Hey, I'm not going to sneeze at $2,000. It's not bad. You know, it's decent. It's not, it's not offensive. Like some people offer you, as an artist... Some people offer you an amount that's just like offensive, you know. It's, I mean, I'm a, I'm a nobody at this point, so two thousand dollars, I'll take it. Um, definitely doesn't probably offset the amount of time I put into it, which is my fault. I mean, I could have made this thing, you know, shitty and spent like a fraction of the time on it, and they probably still would have liked it because it looked pretty cool even back then in the beginning stages, but I, I love them. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna not try, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do my best. I'm trying to do my best, I'm trying to make it as good as I can. Um, so why, why am I starting, starting up with that? Well, first, I mean, I don't know. I do think the truth is sexy, even when it's not sexy. That's the weird thing about the truth. That's the weird thing about it. Uh, I don't like, yeah, I don't like hiding things. I mean, I can, but I prefer not to. Uh, but but actually, more than that, there's something meaning. There's a meaningful reason why I wanted to uh, bring that up. Bring that up. It's because, well, when you do a commission, you know, you gotta try to put you. If you're not an asshole, like a total you know asshole you gotta try to put yourself in the mind of the of the person who's commissioning something and think like uh try to think how see the thing how they see it right um and you know it got me thinking about how they experience las vegas in a very different way than i do um you know, they, they really love Las Vegas. It's like something that they share, it's something that they, something that they love. And there's a lot of people in this world who love Las Vegas. So, you know, you could say, ah, oh, that's interesting. I don't, it's, it's the antithesis of everything that I'm about, right? It's the antithesis of, 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 of all of my aesthetic sensibilities. I mean, you could go so far as to say it was at some point a hellscape for me. <laughs> there was a point in my life when going there was like confronting Satan face to face. You know, like that's how I felt like, especially when I was uh, spiritual, when I was uh, spiritual. I, I like to knock it these days because I really had, I really held spirituality up on a very high pedestal and so I got to be a little iconoclastic towards it I, I don't really I don't really see it as you know such a bad thing uh spirituality that is spiritual belief I don't I don't but people who call themselves spiritual yeah that's just just don't just don't do that okay just don't call yourself spiritual 
it's it's just it just just doesn't sound good it's just are you spiritual or is anybody spiritual am i no longer spiritual because i'm no longer like meditating and shit like that i mean come on come on people have some i don't know have some what do you call that self-consciousness some just come on that just that just yeah What's what's the point? Where where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? Okay, yeah, there was a point. There was a point at which Las Vegas, I I I would have seen it, you know, quite, quite literally, quite quite really as like a sort sort of a satanic place, sort of this very yeah a satanic place, and uh, I mean I don't know I don't think it's hard to you know imagine why right it's like sip superficial it's all you know i mean that's the main thing right isn't that what the 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 isn't that what the whole you know shtick about the devil is in in the traditional religion it's the superficiality the the carnal right the carnal aspect of being incarnate the focusing on the carnal to the exclusion of the soul Right to live as if there were no soul, as if the inner being, you know, didn't have, didn't operate according to some inner laws. So, like for instance, the law that says, you know, that the law that determines that, like, you know, having sex with, you know, your close family is, is, is gross, is, 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 is abhorrent, is disgusting. That is a, now some people would argue that that is culturally determined. I tend, I, I'd like to believe it's not. I'd like to believe that it's like, like a platonic truth that, that, that exists on some other platonic dimension that we have access to as human beings that other animal species don't have access to because they haven't developed, you know, like complex enough souls to like tune into the platonic dimension. I know Platonism is very not cool, you know, very not trendy. Like, uh, you know, it's like to be a Platonist is, is probably like, you know, high crimes and misdemeanors in the in the academic world of today but am i a platonist maybe i don't know i don't know i'm agnostic i'm an agnostic now but i like it i still like it i still like it i still think that if you want a society that functions that doesn't fall into total you know debauchery then you gotta have a wee little bit of platonism a wee little bit of it you know I mean, look at Florence in the 1400s. That place was rocking. You know, they had plenty of debauchery there, but that little bit of Platonism sort of held them together, you know, kept a soul. I, I, I always wanted to write a book called, well, I didn't always, but since I went to Florence and studied art there, I wanted to write a book called Putting the Soul Back in the Renaissance. A look, a look at uh, Neoplatonic philosophy and the importance that it had in the renaissance in general which is getting given short shrift you know like people focus on humanism because it's um you know it's it, it goes along with the secular it goes along with uh atheism to be quite frank and most academics are you know want to promote atheism these days so you know but you know that that's you know if you're trying to create a, a culture and an atmosphere where to even, you know, posit the existence of the soul is laughable and gets you sent out from the halls of serious academic thought, then, you know, you know, ridiculing and reviling, you know, uh, you know, anything like Platonism is that's your what you want. That's what you're going to want to do. Right. You're going to want to make it ridiculous and feel ridiculous and anyone who stands up for it feel ridiculous but sorry to burst your bubbles uh you know the neoplatonic 
philosophy and uh, that was jiving all through the Renaissance that was so integral to the intellectual fervor and the the motivation the, the the sources of energy that kept those amazing artists and thinkers motivated the same can be said for Isaac Newton I mean people like to like people like Noam Chomsky like to snub their nose at the fact that what he, you know, 90% of what he generated was just garbage and useless, but that 10%, you know what, that 90% that you scoff at, I haven't really looked through it, I don't know, I'm, I'm not spiritual anymore, so. but that 90% is integral to what motivated him, what drove him to dig ever deeper, to go down as deep as he could, and plumb the depths of his mind and soul for insights that would bring him closer to God. I mean, give me a break. You want to scoff at that? You want to snub your nose at that? No wonder we have no wonder we're not making great discoveries. You know, there's been no amazing advancements outside of like digital tech in the last uh, you know, however long. We're we're not we're not driven I mean, people are driven. They're driven by very egotistical concerns. Is that ever going to be enough to really take you all the way? I don't know. All right. That's enough musing. That's enough musing, Brian. Let's get down off your high horse, right? And Platonism. I'm starting to do something here that's bad. I'm carrying the same color all the way through. I got to shift it up. That's why, because I'm lazy. I really don't like switching colors and... If I can do the same thing with the same color without switching out, I'm very happy to do it, but that's a bad habit that I gotta break. I gotta switch it up up here. All right, what I was trying to say, I don't know, what was I trying to say? Before I went to the Renaissance, you can tell this is gonna take a while, right? You're like, what the hell? You're trying to talk about the postmodern surviving in the postmodern wasteland. Not, you took us to the renaissance how how are you gonna get anywhere but how are you gonna make progress i don't know i might maybe i won't make progress maybe i'm just not progressive enough um Ba, 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 ba. I make this noise sometimes like trying to like jumpstart my mind because I'm going into cognitive decline because I'm 40 years old and my brain no longer functions the way it used to due to years and years of lack of sleep, which, you know, set on after I had a kid and they woke me up. But I love, I love my daughter, but she did definitely ruin my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I got hardcore uh, uh, insomnia after, after she, like she disrupted my sleeping pattern for, you know, uh, I don't know, six years. I don't know until I until like, she finally was like, <laughs> not waking me up every morning. Um, it's a price I'd gladly pay. She's the best thing. Being, being a dad is the best thing that I've ever done. I love it. And I love her. Where was I going? What was I saying? Oh, yes. I'm going into cognitive decline because of prolonged insomnia. However, I think that it's not fair to blame her completely. Because I think it coincided with uh, uh, sleep apnea also becoming an issue. So, so anyway, enough of my medical issues. What were we talking about? The postmodern wasteland, surviving in the postmodern. Okay, well, let's go back to my grandma, right? My grandma and her boyfriend. They love Las Vegas, which proves, if in case anyone doubted it, that it is possible to love Las Vegas. What does it mean that it's possible to love Las Vegas? That's an interesting question. What does it mean? Well, the first thing that it implies is that my perspective on Las Vegas is not, you know, the fundamental objective 
be all end all be all perspective on Las Vegas. Like you can have another perspective on Las Vegas. I very first thought about this in the year 2002 when I came back from Ireland after having a massive, I don't know, psychological breakdown uh, related to a very early incarnation of my attempt to underwrite the next paradigm for Western civilization. Different story. But I was listening a lot to, back in those days, um, a band from the 80s, I believe, called the Cockatoo Twins. I, I guess that's how you'd say it. Cockatoo Twins? Cockatoo Twins, I guess. Uh, they were sort of like a punk, a gothic punk band, you could maybe call them. Uh, very, very cool. Very beautiful music. Love them still. Actually, I should put them on. I should put them on. Maybe I'll, I'll mix them into this video. And um, they had an album called Heaven or Las Vegas. To this day, I've never, I've never understood whether or not they meant like heaven, which is a good thing, or Las Vegas, which is also a good thing. Like, mm, do I want cake or cookies? Or did they mean heaven or hell? So if it's the if it's the latter, then there then I could have taken from it, I could have taken from that title of that album that they intended to uh, mean you know to talk about Las Vegas sort of in the way that I see it, which was sort of like I said a hellscape, a hellscape, or as I've called it here, the, the a wasteland, you know, a wasteland of meaning and depth and 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 authenticity, right? to tap back into James Lindsay. But that other alternative I found interesting. You know, like, what if they really did mean it like, you know, heaven or this awesome place, like, you know, Las Vegas. What if they liked Las Vegas? What does that mean? What would that mean in that case? And, um... I mean, you know, I was young, I was 20, 21, I think. And so to me, like, you know, I mean, I looked up to them as artists. So I'm like, well, they must, you know, there must be something to it. So, uh, you know, I thought about what that would be. They, they are, a, they are, were, are, were, were, are, I suppose they still exist as individuals, at least they are Scottish. And so... I wondered, okay, they're coming from Scotland. They probably went to Las Vegas while they were touring as a band. And maybe they fell in love with it. They were just like, oh, this place is so fun and different than anything we experienced when we were growing up in cold Scotland. And of course, this is, I don't know why Scotland always comes up for me, always comes up for me over and over through my life. I'm drawn to Scotland. In fact, that massive, like, psychological breakdown that I had related to my initial attempt to underwrite the new paradigm for Western civilization occurred after I took a ferry from Ireland to Scotland for the express purpose of studying the architecture of Charles Rene Macintosh, an amazing groundbreaking Scottish architect in Glasgow. Also a different separate story. Just, I mean, I'm just saying it's interesting. Scotland always comes up for me. Scotland, Scotland, Scotland. But I grew up here. I grew up in California. Far away. I grew up in California, which is a lot like the... It's a, it's a soft version of Las Vegas. So, you know, it's also a postmodern nightmare, a postmodern hellscape, a postmodern wasteland. A wasteland of endless strip malls and soulless architecture, right? It's also that here. But it's a soft version, whereas it's in your face in Las Vegas. It's so in your face. And here it's sort of like, you know, it's it's the little, you know, they try to, so I don't know. They try to make it have a little more dignity. It's not, you know, I mean, uh, we do have Disneyland. Disneyland is just like Las Vegas. It's just like Las Vegas for kids rather than for adults. Um, but it's got all the same, you know, it's all the same inauthentic, sort of communication of inauthenticity in, 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 in that, uh, you know, that Las Vegas has. Same vibe, 
Same vibe. Same basic vibe. Just minus the sex. <laughs> Las Vegas is Disneyland plus sex. <laughs> Basically. Sex and gambling and debauchery. Um, my point is that for me growing up in the postmodern wasteland, the wasteland aspect of it was what was front and center for me. And as a sensitive young soul, it I, I suffered because of that. Whereas I noticed so many Scot Scottish people who to me sound like, I want to use a British term, I'm hoping I use it correctly, they sound like mingy little slags bitching about, you know, how cold and gray it is in, in Scotland. It rains all the time. Thank you, Trigonometry, for that word, mingy little slags, that term. I, I like that. It's very evocative. I hope I've used it correctly. Uh, I, I, think it's a, I think it's like an equivalent for a whiny little bitch. Um, oh my God, growing up in the desert, to go to a land that is green and verdant, to feel rain on your face every day. I mean, I was, I was in Ireland every day for, for four months. It rained on me literally every day. I didn't mind. I mean, you know, I'm coming from the desert. Maybe I would have minded after, you know, I would have been just like them, I guess, if I had grown up there. I would have been just like the people of the British Isles who whine and bitch about the weather so much. But, oh, I always loved gray skies. I always loved overcast fog. It's a beautiful, beautiful feeling. But anyway, anyway, you guys want to, you guys want to claim your right to bitch about the weather. Fucking claim your right. You have the right to feel however you feel. But this is what I was thinking, basically. I was thinking, okay, so these Scottish people, maybe they came over here to Las Vegas, and it's just so radically different than what they grew up with. And of course, you know, they're just like, I'm not appreciating the things that I grew up with, like the weather. They're not appreciating the dignity of the, like the architecture and the landscape that they grew up with, uh, the, the sense of history and rootedness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I was thinking, okay, well, let me try to see it from their eyes. So after I came back from uh, from Ireland and Scotland, I, I I went out to Las Vegas with my uh, with my parents, you know, just uh, my family. We made a little family trip out there, and I, and so I try to walk around. I listened to Heaven or Las Vegas, the album by the Cockney Twins, and I, I tried to see it like, you know, can I see this the way that maybe they were seeing it? And I couldn't quite, I couldn't quite. I kind of got into it a little bit, but I couldn't quite get there all the way. And that was interesting. That was interesting. I made a heroic effort. I think the effort matters. I'm gonna pause it now and collect my thoughts a bit and mix some new colors. So what I'm gonna try to do is I wanna, I wanna kinda de-intensify this blue I was trying to make this thing look like it was glowing with some neon light uh, based on a photo that I was looking at it uh, looking at of it and but the photo was at night and I don't know what I was thinking you know it just doesn't it doesn't go with this sort of day I guess it sort of works down here because this is an unreality that it's that it's melting into but up here it just looks it looks pretty garish uh, so I want it to fit in a little bit better with this uh, the sense of light up here. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be realistic. This is obviously not a painting obsessed with uh, realism, but I just don't like it. I just don't like how it's looking, so I'm going to try to fix that. Okay, I can tell that I don't have a lot of energy left and that um, the quality of my insights will, whoop, it's gonna degrade, it's gonna go down, it's gonna go down dramatically, sharply, and quickly. Um, also the quality of my painting. So I'm gonna have to try to finish up what I'm doing and what I want to say relatively quickly. That is a good thing to, to keep in mind, right? We don't have the luxury of time. That's another thing that I try to remember always now in my 
in my mature artistic life like I used to paint like I had all the time in the world on each painting and you know you, that, that goes back to painting with intention and not wasting your time on layers of paint that get buried that no one ever sees it's like you don't have that much time in this life you know you make it count make do something that's you know make it count make it count anyway anyway I, I'm a little hesitant of whether I can do what I want to do here and do what I want to do there but I'm gonna try I'm gonna try so I mean honestly if I'm if I'm 100% Honest, I, I, I'm more concerned with articulating the what it means to survive in the postmodern wasteland than with getting these little highlights on the Ferris wheel that I want to get. Although I'd be very happy if I can somehow accomplish both. I'd be very, very happy. Um, all right, so the post surviving the postmodern wasteland. I, I started this off by like, you know, just sort of posing the question, well, what did, what did it mean? What did it mean to various people like my grandma, like these, you know, these musicians that I'm sort of kind of hypothetically wondering, you know, whether wondering about, you know, what, what did it Trying to get into it by, you know, imagining Las Vegas from a different, a whole different perspective. What, what is, what are some other possibilities for what Las Vegas may, you know, mean, feel like, look like, you know, the experience of Las Vegas through uh, people who are not me, right? Uh, it's a worthwhile thing to do with any, any question, right? Um, and... And then I don't, I can't really quite get there. I can't, I never really make that bridge all the way over to like being able to fully, you know, uh, ex at least experience what they, what that, that sort of sense of what they maybe experienced fully. I, I get a little bit close. I can imagine it. It's different to imagine it than to, you know, have like, you know, a similar experience where you're really like, yeah, I get it hundred percent. I can imagine getting it 100%. That's the funny thing. I can imagine getting it, but to actually get it, I don't, I don't know. Don't think I... And so then, and so then the question, what, how, what, how does that affect the question? What does the question become? You know, is there something objective in my experience? of am i am i just limited is it just that i'm i'm limited by you know being brian dk has this particular background and feels the particular way he feels about the postmodern landscape and just can't get over it just never will get over it because it's just part of who i am or is there something objective about it that i that in my experience is there an element of my experience that should not be discounted, you know, and that I'm too willing to discount, you know, over this sort of like, you know, desire to imagine, you know, to be open minded, to imagine things from another person's point of view, yada, 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 something like that, right? And I, I think. I think there's room for both of these things to, I think there's definitely room for both of these things to, to be, to be. There's room for both of these things to be. I can, it, it can be true that my perceptions growing up in the postmodern hellscape are valid, have their objectivity. There are objective reasons for decrying the ugliness and, and the fakeness of the postmodern hellscape that we've constructed with uh, postmodern architecture. Modern and postmodern architecture, I should say, because it, they really work together to create this unique, the unique flavor of the hell that we live in. 
Oh God, isn't that, isn't that horrible whiny little bitch? Yeah, why we don't live in hell in the Western world. We're very, very lucky to, what I mean is the, the hellscape, the, the, the soullessness. That's the thing. Soullessness is like a, it's like a first world problem, right? Um, I, our architecture doesn't have any soul. Right? You can make fun of that. You can be like, oh, God, you know, like, it's, you got food in your grocery store. You know, you're well taken care of. Don't, don't complain. Right? And if, and if someone wants to make that, if someone wants to make that argument, well, hell yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That, that argument is there to be made. It's, there's some truth. There's some truth to that, for, to be sure, you know? To be sure. What are you gonna say? What are you gonna say about that? You can't. You can't deny that. Maybe that goes along with the the what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get to. Then, if what I'm trying to describe is, you know, this unique flavor of surviving and thriving in the postmodern postmodern wasteland, part of it comes from the recognition that this postmodern hellscape, soul soulless. I shouldn't. This, yeah, just, it's a hellscape for the soul. It's not a hellscape for the physical existence. Definitely not. But that's, maybe that's what I'm trying to get at, is that this soulless, this this place that has detrimental effects for the human soul is wrapped up in a place that ha that is the best we've ever arrived at for providing for the body. And ultimately, you know, the majority of us, you know, I mean, like, who's going to say that the body doesn't take precedence over the soul? It kind of does. It kind of does. We can pretend that it doesn't. We can get all romantic and, like, say that it, you know, wish that it that it didn't or think that maybe life would be better if it didn't or what, you know, try as hard as we can to act as if it didn't. But I mean, we, we all really, come on. Come on, let's not fool ourselves. We, we, very few people are willing to, you know, be martyrs and, you know, die for the soul. They're out there. I don't even know that we should celebrate them all the time. Look at all the people willing, the jihadis willing to die for whatever freaking thing they think they're dying for. You know, it's, uh, maybe it's not such a great thing. <laughs> Or maybe it is. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't doesn't really doesn't really have to do with what I'm trying to look at here. I want to describe this place of comfort that you can come to when you accept things as they are. So, like, I want to make I want to change the world. I want to make the world a better place. And my little piece of the pie, my little piece of the puzzles, not that, you know not that profound it's just having to do with aesthetics you know people can argue maybe it's not such an important piece of the pie you know it's not i'm not i'm probably not gonna bring a cure to disease and you know not gonna you know, I'm, you know it's, I'm just a, it's aesthetics it's just aesthetics you know it's like maybe a superficial shallow thing maybe maybe not i don't know but um But, where was I going with that? I think I was going somewhere, but I don't remember. Oh, yeah. Just, you know, while I'm struggling to, to make my contribution, while I'm trying to, um, while I'm trying to, you know, yeah, make my contribution, talk about the way that I'd like to make the world a better place, I need to simultaneously uh, appreciate what it is and all the good things that are in it already. And, and so part of that acknowledgement is what I mean by surviving in the postmodern wasteland. It's better to call it a wasteland than a hellscape. I mean, I was just listening to, I can't even, I don't even know her name, the, the, Korean, the, survive, the survivor from the, the North Korean defector who's, you know, <clears throat> been kind of <clears throat> making the rounds right now with a lot of the People like uh, Jordan Peterson and just watched her interview with Jordan Peterson. Oh my God. I mean, the things she went through. I mean, she can talk about a hellscape like 
you know, North Korea is a, a hellscape. That's a hellscape. So let's just call it a wasteland. It's a postmodern wasteland. I think, you know, ironically enough, ironically enough, I think uh, it's probably a similar thing that, what's that dude? Not James Joyce, but that other dude, that other big modernist writer that everyone loves. The guy, the guy who was friends with Hemingway. What's his name? Elliot. T.S. Eliot. Yeah, didn't he write something about a wasteland? You know, his whole spiel was... It's so funny how people want to slice and dice, you know, modernism and postmodernism. They were already... The modernists were already talking about a lot of the same shit that the postmodern, at least in literature, at least in art, you know, the, the things that they want to say characterize postmodernism. They were all... It was already there. It was not... It was not that big of a breakthrough. The You know, at least aesthetically at least in art at least in culture maybe not necessarily in philosophy or whatever but yeah it's funny it's funny how, how that goes anyway yeah t.s Eliot, he was writing about the wasteland right it's probably the same thing it's just an earlier incarnation it's just a, a different slightly different version you know uh it hadn't quite maybe degenerated as as much as it has by this time when he was writing but it's the same basic stuff he's talking about soul and this he's talking about a a wasteland of the of the human soul of the internal life not necessarily the an external you know not a hellscape it's not a hellscape it's not north korea it's not you know it's not syria for the last 10 years it's it's a different it's a different thing it's a wasteland it's just a wasteland you can survive in the wasteland. You can even thrive. It's not easy. It's not easy. But you can. It's possible. You can thrive in the wasteland. If you know how to get by. You know how to you know how to make a go of it. This is what I want to come to is like once you've made a decision that no, this is where I'm gonna make my stand. This is where I belong. I'm not going to go to Europe and find my roots and find my soul and then be like, oh, this is my spiritual homeland. This is where I was. No, no. I'm making my stand. I'm going to bloom where I was planted. You turn towards it. You embrace it as it is. You embrace what's there. Sure, you want to change it. Sure, you want to, you know, give the fruits of, of your insights and hope that it contributes to something good. But you, in the meantime, you got to embrace what's in front of you. When you make that turn, something very interesting happens. And then you almost can fall in love with that thing that you spent so long, you know, pushing against and hating and reviling and, you know, almost, almost. And, and that's the interesting thing for me. I mean, I'm not there. I don't love Las Vegas. I'll probably never love Las Vegas. Never. But I'll never love Las Vegas, but I, but I don't hate it. I couldn't make this painting if I hated it. I couldn't I I I couldn't hate it without, you know, hating my grandma. And I don't hate my grandma. I love my grandma, you know? So what does that what does that say? You know, it's like it says something about, I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's too late, getting too late, I'm too tired now. You inevitably, if you're able to make a go of it, if you're able to survive in the wasteland, in the desert, let's say, you know, you're going to start to love it. You're going to start loving the desert. And I start to love the wasteland. But what then? What if you staked your life on, you know, your, your, your intellectual development on pushing back against the, in, let's say, spiritual injustices that you experienced when you were growing up? You know, the, 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 and I will, I will say that this, you know, this, fake postmodern the, the 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 postmodern hodgepodge with its cynical irony is a spiritual injustice against 
the human soul. I will say that and I will stand by that. But when you have completed that turn, when you've embraced the things as they are, you know, the fact that that's just part of where we're at right now as the human species. And your soul has grown tough. And you've been able to psychologically survive and maybe even slightly thrive amidst it all. You, you, you will start to love everything that you've been in contact with. Everything that your life has touched will feel meaningful and beautiful. You can't help it then. You can't help it. You know, if you're not at war deep in your soul with Las Vegas, then you can simply offer the insights that you have about the different world that we might construct and how that could look and what kind of effects that would have for the human beings growing up in, let's face it, the whole world can't be Las Vegas, right? Growing up in the normal world, the ordinary world. You give what you have to give, you give what you have to offer, but you accept what's there. You even maybe get a little attached to it, a little, you find that weird beauty that coalesces from the imperfect, the, the imperfection. That's a funny place to be. That's surviving in the postmodern wasteland. I would just say don't don't fall in love with it so much that you forget where you came from, what you passed through, the psychological travails that almost destroyed you. Don't forget about that because there's others coming up, young ones coming up who don't have that protection, maybe weren't able to complete the the journey to get through all that shit. Now, I'm speaking very abstractly here, but in order to for you to understand what I mean, you have to understand that I do believe that a lot of our psychological sickness in our culture, you know, that, that, that does bring people down, that drags certain people down, that, you know, dragged me down for a long time, maybe almost killed me uh, from psychological uh, problems. Uh, God, I hate to, I'm, I'm not going to blame it all on that, but it sure didn't help. Right. It sure didn't help to grow up in a society that seemed to lack a soul. Right? There's a lot to talk about there. I hope you've enjoyed my ranting and raving about survival in the postmodern wasteland. Hope it's given you some new perspectives or some enjoyable perspectives. I hope I'm closer to being done with this and uh, I hope you'll join me with <laughs> for another rant in the future, which I'm sure will be forthcoming before too long. Good night.